Today on Let's Get Cozy, we're going to share the next several chapters of Robert Kimmel Smith's The War with Grandpa. I can't wait to find out what happens when Grandpa Jack comes, don't you, Kiaya? Well, it's time. Sit back, relax, get cozy. It's story time with Kiaya and Daniel. are such an important part of our lives. Join my friend Kiaya and I for Get Cozy because it's story time with Kiaya and Daniel where we share some of the greatest picture books and chapters from children's and young adult literature to inspire you to keep embedding literacy into your days. Chapter 7, Bits and Pieces. I notice that my sentences are getting too long again. I will write them shorter. About my dad. He started moving things, my things, from my room up to the guest room on the top floor, which is also the third floor. My toy cabinets, they are yellow formica. Formica, hello, formica with white tops, two doors outside, three shelves inside, and all my good stuff was in them. All my board games, Monopoly, Stratomatic Baseball, Clue, Careers, Risk, Snakes and Ladders, all of my crayons in plastic boxes. Most of them were broken anyway. Old coloring books I only use when I'm homesick. All my baseball cards were on the top of the cabinets in these shoe boxes. I have been saving them since I was seven. I have almost 2,000 baseball cards, counting extras. Then, my mom moved all my summer clothes upstairs into the closet in the guest room. My new room. I had to help my dad move my bookcase upstairs. First, I moved my trophies. They go on the top of the bookcase. I had six of them, all gold. They were baseball trophies from playing on my Beverly Boys Club team since I was six years old. Every kid who plays gets one. The other trophy was for a bowling tournament. I bowled a 96. My best score of all time. Let me be honest. Every kid with a bowling tournament got one too. To move the bookcase upstairs, we first had to empty it. We put all my books on the floor first. All my Encyclopedia Brown books. All my Great Brain books. My whole collection of sports stories. All my paperbacks with baseball team records. My room began to look empty when we got it all upstairs. Then we moved my pictures from the walls and hung them upstairs. Hank Aaron hitting his 715th home run, Tom Seaver pitching, the first astronauts on the moon, some of the best drawings I made in school. Pretty soon, my walls were naked. Now my room looked weird. It didn't look like my room anymore. Lying on my bed, I began to think, it wasn't my room, like I didn't belong there. A few days before Grandpa came, we moved my dresser. First, we took the drawers out one by one. Then we carried them up the stairs. Then we moved the dresser. It wasn't too heavy. Then we moved the old dresser from the guest room down into my room. Every night, I had to go upstairs to bring down my clean clothes for the next day. We moved my desk next. It went upstairs into the corner of the guest room. I had to go up to the top floor every day after school to do my homework. The only thing left in my room was my bed. And the night before Grandpa came, 
we moved it upstairs to. Now all the guest room stuff was in my room, and all my things were up on the top floor in the guest room. I guess you'll stop, start sleeping up here tonight, my dad said. I didn't say anything. Are you okay, Pete? My dad asked. You look like you're going to cry any second. I won't cry, I said. I hope that was true. You'll get used to it, Dad said. He looked out the window. Nice view from up here. Take a look, Pete. I stood next to my father and looked out. The cow house stood on the cliff across the street. The street light on the corner showed through the trees. The tree on our lawn looked so close, I could almost feel it. Almost as I could touch one of the branches. My dad put his arm around my shoulders. Growing up, Pete, he said, it isn't easy. Sometimes you have to do things you don't like. I hate it up here, I said. Dad sighed. I know, Peter. But you mustn't let, ever let Grandpa Jack know that, or else he'd feel terrible. And believe me, he feels terrible already. I didn't say anything when Dad hugged me. I didn't feel any better either. The last thing that was moved into the guest room with me. Chapter 8 Night Fright I'm a little ashamed of this part of my story, but I have to tell the truth. Not only was I mad as a wet hairnet about losing my great room, I was a little bit scared about sleeping upstairs, too. I brushed my teeth and did my go-to bed things and, and in the top floor bathroom instead of the beautiful bathroom Jenny and I shared downstairs. I had this dinky, dim bathroom now. It was gross. The mirror was very old and had dark stains on it. The sink was very tiny and a kind of yellow and stuff instead of being white. And the walls were dark old wood, like some rough cabin in the woods. I went downstairs to my parents' bedroom and kissed Mom goodnight. On the way back upstairs, I peeked into my old room. It looked strange to see different furniture in there. Strange and kind of hurting. It was scary to go upstairs to my room. The staircase leading to the top floor was narrow and rickety. The steps were bare wood that creaked when you stepped on them, and there wasn't too much light. Not like the steps leading to the second floor, which were covered with thick carpet and had a beautiful light fixture, so everything was plain as day. The hallway upstairs was spooky, a narrow little space that was very dark, with open doors to empty rooms that looked like black caves where someone could be hiding. Don't get any ideas there, Yaga. I know that sounds silly, but that's what I was feeling. There is no boogeyman who waits in the dark to grab kids. I know that, but at 9 o'clock at night, in this dim little hallway with the floorboards creaking, you get frightened whether you know that or not. I kind of jumped into my new room and slammed the door shut fast, and just as fast jumped into bed and under the covers. I waited a while before I turned off my lamp. I was in no hurry for it to get dark. But finally I did it, and that turned out to be scary too. Like I said before, in my old room, I knew where everything was and how everything was, and there was nothing scary. But up here, it was different. A light flickered on the ceiling and the wall, making shadows that jumped around, and a rustling noise came from outside the window, and something in the hallway made a sound. Was it a footstep outside my door? I may sound very brave just writing these things down so easy, the truth was, I was terrified, out of my mind. The waving shadows of yellow light on the wall almost began to look like two black arms that could grab me. Be still, my heart, I whispered myself. I whispered to myself, which is something my mom says sometimes. I felt like an idiot talking to myself, but I was the only company I had in that room. It's nothing, I said. I crossed my fingers, then I crossed my toes, and I fell asleep and hoped that everything would be hunky-dory. Ha! 
I got into my best sleeping position, which is curled up on my right side with my hands tucked up under my cheek. The rustling sound had to be from the big old tree outside my window, I figured after a while. And the spooky yellow light was probably the street lamp on the corner, and the noises outside my door were just old floor boards creaking. And there really wasn't a crook or a murderer sneaking up here to get me. Probably. And then I began to get angry. Why was I the only one in the house who had to give something up for Grandpa? Why me? And why was I stuck up here in this disgusting and scary place instead of staying in my great and wonderful old room? I thought about my illustrated book of old sea battles and the picture of John Paul Jones on deck with his big curved sword in the air. I have just begun to fight, he said. It gave me an idea. Maybe there was a way I could fight to get back what was really mine. But how? That's what I was thinking about when I finally fell asleep. Chapter 9, Grandpa Jack. Now I have to tell you about my Grandpa Jack and what happened when he finally came to our house to live and how he settled in and everything like that. And that's another too long sentence. I used to know my grandparents very well when I was little and they lived close by. I remember they used to come to our house most weekends and they played with me a lot. But then Grandma got this terrible disease. They call it emphysema, but they spell it emphysema. It comes from smoking cigarettes, which if anybody does, they have to be crazy. This emphysema made it very hard for Grandma to breathe. Mom said that only on windy or cold days, Grandma was not allowed to put a foot outside her house or any other part of her either. It was around then that Jenny was born, and Grandma and Grandpa moved to Florida. Mom said it was good for the warm weather, which was good for Grandma's lungs. I remember being sad when they left. I loved them a lot. I loved how they always wanted to play with me, and almost anything I did was okay with them. Starting then, I saw them only when we would go to their house in Florida at Christmas. The rest of the year, we would talk on the telephone maybe once a week. Then, Grandma died. Now, Grandpa was alone, it was hard to think about. I only knew my Grandma and Grandpa together. They were never apart when they saw me and my family. They were a pair, like shoes or gloves. But now, there was only Grandpa. Dad brought Grandpa home from the airport. He pulled the car up in the driveway and tooted the horn. We all ran outside and Jenny jumped right on Grandpa's neck as soon as he got out of the car, even though Mom had said not to. Dad finally had to take her down. Then Grandpa gave me a long hug and held me away to look at me. You're no Peapod anymore, he said, which was a nickname he had called me. Petey, you're springing up like a weed. You must have grown three inches since Christmas. He smiled at me then, with little lines crinkling up around his eyes. I smiled back at him. He looked different to me from the last time I'd seen him. The lines and wrinkles in his tan face looked deeper. His shoulders stooped down, and there was kind of a sad look in his eyes, even when he was smiling. And when we finally got into the house with Dad and me helping to carry Grandpa's things, I could see that Grandpa was limping worse than ever. Grandpa used to be in the construction business until he retired, building houses mostly. Years ago, a big piece of wood fell on him and broke his leg. Mom and Grandma always said it never healed right, and now Grandpa had something wrong in his leg that Mom called arthritis. It was late when Grandpa arrived, and we all carried his things upstairs and tried to help him get settled into his room. My room, I mean, my old room that was now his. My idea of helpful was to take Grandpa's shirts out of his suitcase and put them into his dresser. Jenny's idea of helpful was to do pirouettes in the middle of the room, banging into everybody. Mom finally shooed Jenny and me out and made us get ready for bed. I did all 
my go-to bed thing and got into my pajamas and went downstairs to the kitchen to say goodnight to mom and dad. They were sitting at the kitchen table drinking tea. I knew when I walked in that they were saying private things to each other because they shut up quick when I came in and looked at me kind of funny. My mom looked real sad like she was getting ready to cry. She hugged me a little extra tight, I thought, and ruffled my hair. I said goodnight. I didn't go back to my room though. What I did was hang around under the staircase to hear what they were saying. I was so right about my mom. She was crying. He looked so awful. She sobbed. Please, Sally, I heard my dad say. He's very tired, you know. It's been a very long day for him. He'll be fine after he gets some rest. There's just no life in him. Mom said, no life. It's only a few months since she died, Dad said. He's very depressed. Give it time, hon. I hope you're right, Mom said. I sneaked up the stairs very quietly so my folks couldn't hear me and went to say goodnight to Grandpa. He was sitting on the edge of the bed holding something in his hand. I could see it was a photograph of Grandma in a silver frame. Good night, Grandpa, I said, but I don't think he heard me. He just kept very still staring at Grandma's face in the picture. My mom was right. I thought as I went up to my room, Grandpa had no life at all. Could you die from being sad? I wondered. Could you? Chapter 10. Another night, another fright. It was still scary upstairs in my new room, maybe even more than it was the night before. The floorboards creaked again. The same shadows and light danced around on the ceiling. I still had the thought that a murderer was waiting outside my door to come in and kill me in my bed. You can laugh all you want. I was scared silly. Chapter 11 Only a Dope Will Mope now I have to tell you about a special word. It's called mope. My sister Jenny does that a lot. She's a real moper, Mom says. It means standing around with your face hanging out and looking like doomsday is tomorrow. Only a dope will mope, Mom says to Jenny all the time. Usually Jenny mopes when she wants Mom to stop what she's doing and play cards with her or something. Naturally, Jenny always does her moping when Mom is real busy like before dinner or lunch or when mom is about to go shopping, shopping or clean up something. Not now, mom says, and don't mope. The reason I'm telling you about moping is because that is exactly what grandpa is doing. Except he called it resting. He hung around in his room practically all the time. When I asked him to take a walk somewhere with me, he'd just say, no thanks, Petey, I'll just rest here a while. Sometimes he'd do his sitting in the living room, and that's all he'd do. Sit. He'd sort of stare out into the air and not even pick up a magazine or watch TV. After, or after lunch, sometimes I'd ask him to have a catch with me. Or maybe walk down to the candy store and get an ice cream cone. Not today, Petey. Thanks, he'd say. And he'd sit on the porch or in the living room and just do nothing. I'll bet in the first couple of weeks he was living with us, he never even went as far as around the corner. He just sat around. That wasn't how he acted in Florida when, before, and when Grandma died. Back then, when I was little, I remember how peppy he was. We'll have more fun than a barrel of monkeys, Grandpa used to say. And we did. He used to take me to places like the park and the zoo. I was always happy when I was with him. I liked everything about him. His little white mustache that I jumped up and down when he talked, the way he'd throw me up in the air and catch me or spin me around fast, holding me in his arms. Even his breath, which always smelled of peppermints. I liked the way he'd toss me a ball and I'd try to catch it. I was little then and could hardly hold onto the ball, but it was fun playing with him. 
I know Mom and Dad were concerned about Grandpa, and the way he just seemed to be tired out and moping all the time. We went to the movies a couple of times and to a restaurant, but Grandpa always stayed home. You go ahead, he'd say. I'll be okay back here by my lonesome. Come on, Dad would say. We'll have some fun. Have fun then, Grandpa would say. I'll only spoil it for you. I saw the worried looks that passed between Mom and Dad. But when I asked Dad about it, he just said, Grandpa's a little tired, Peter. That's all. He'll snap out of it soon. Sure, I thought. But how soon? It was soon. Chapter 12. A little help from my friends. I don't care what you say, my friend Steve Meyer said. I think it stinks. Steve's right, Billy Alston said. Your grandfather is a room robber, and it isn't fair. By the way, Steve said, I'm invading Quebec. We were playing Risk, which is, out, which is what we always played at Steve's house. Outside the living room window, it was raining like crazy. Steve is a Risk fanatic, or expert, or both. Billy and I can never beat him. But today, I was doing especially bad. Maybe because I wasn't playing, paying close attention. Steve and Billy have been my friends ever since we met in kindergarten. Steve is taller than me and thinner, and he wears those rim-horned eyeglasses. Maybe because he reads so much. Billy is a little shorter than both of us, and he has crinkly red hair and thousands of freckles on his face. When Billy was six years old, his dad hung a, chin a chinning bar in the doorway of his room. Whenever Billy goes in or out, he always chins himself a few times. Billy can do 15 chin-ups. I know that because once I bet him he couldn't, and I lost a quarter. I can do three and a half chin-ups. Steve, you can hardly do one. Throw the dice, Steve said, and I did. I lost another army, of course, and Steve had one more territory of mine to control. Steve looked at me and shook his head. You're such a dummy, he said. Look, I said, he's my grandfather. What can I do? Put up a fight, Steve said. Stick up for your rights. I already have, I said. I won't let nobody take my room, Billy said. He made a fist and slammed it into his other palm, right in the nose. Right, Billy, Steve said, winking at me. We both knew that Billy always talked tough like that. But the one time he had to face up to a kid in school called Phil Steinkraus, he was as chicken as the rest of us. I'm trapped, don't you see, I said. I can't let my grandpa know how mad I am at losing my room. And if I can't even talk about it, what can I do? Wishy-washy, Steve said. What are you, a doormat? You can't let a room robber walk all over you, Billy said. Steve put down his fourth set of matched risk cards and collected ten more armies. On the board, he already controlled half the world, which meant the game wasn't going to last too much longer. He looked at me funny, and then a slow grin started to spread all over his face. Just got an idea, Steve said. Yes, sirree, it might just work. I waited while the wheels turned around in Steve's head. 1776, Steve said. Billy said, huh? The Yankees against the power of the British Army, Steve went on. Here come the Redcoats marching across a field in close formation. That's the way the British always fought. And what do the Minutemen do? They hide behind trees and rocks. They shoot from behind cover and keep moving. What does this have to do with Grandpa? Billy asked. Steve sailed on. Do you know that the British complained that the Minutemen didn't fight fair? Fair! Steve, I began, the legend of Zorro, Steve went on, a rich and powerful man who fought the power of the king. He had to conceal his identity because to fight against the king meant certain death. So what did he do to keep the peasants, tr and against, peasants against tyranny? He hid his face behind a mask. Like Batman and Robin, Billy said. Close, Steve said. What am I supposed to do? I asked. Get a sword and fight a duel? With Grandpa? 
Guerrilla warfare, Steve said, almost to himself. When you're trapped and there's no other way, you fight from behind rocks. You conceal your identity. You're crazy, I said. It's the only way, Steve said. Think about it. We hope you enjoyed these last several chapters of Robert Kimmel Smith's The War with Grandpa as much as Kiaya and I enjoyed sharing them with you. We can't wait till next week when we read the next few chapters together with you. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you tomorrow for another episode of Get Cozy. It's story time with Kiaya and Daniel. Remember, reading is power.